Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Zebulon Maletsky. I am an associate professor of Africana Studies and History at uh, Stony Brook University. And it is my distinct pleasure to be speaking to the Elmont Public Library uh, today and to be joined by a very special guest, uh, Mr. Fred Nurse, who is a local uh, who uh, grew up in uh, South Floral Park, uh, which is not too far from Elma. Um, he is a graduate of Hofstra University School of Business, uh, retired uh, from medical sales. Uh, he's been a board member of the Brooklyn Council of Churches, but most importantly, uh, he's a lecturer and a historian and a teacher who uh, has had a profound impact on how we tell the stories, how we understand Black history, Black History Month, uh, both locally in Long Island, but also uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, he has uh, been an author of uh, at least three books um, with a new one on the way, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, that's um, correct. <laughs> uh, but you can find his uh, previous books. How to and so uh, Fred Nurse uh, is a Renaissance man in many ways, and he's written about a number of topics. And his new work is going to be looking at some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. Um, I should also hasten to add he's been honored as Father of the Year by the County Executive of Nassau County, New York honored by the Jamaican Business Resource Center for his business acumen and consulting. And he is uh, retired, as they say, but uh, never uh, uh, stays away from, from, from the battlefront. And so it gives me a great pleasure to be joined by uh, Mr. Fred Nurse, uh, who uh, is gonna also participate, help me in, this, in our discussion and really guide us as somebody who uh, hails from the area and has some interesting insights that we think you might we might also find interesting. Mr. Fred Nurse, welcome, sir. Hey, thank you so kindly, Dr. Valeski. It is a privilege to join you good folks today. <clears throat> Let me begin by saying that, uh, yes, I grew up in South Laurel Park, not very far from where Elmont Memorial Library is presently. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I'm a graduate of Sawanica High School, and I went to Alberti Manor high, uh, Junior High School, which is right there on Hempstead Turnpike. Yes, I also am a graduate of Alberti Stanford Junior High School, which is now the library. So that brings me great honor to be with you good folks, and I hope that we can bring to you some information that is mm, interesting and something that will enliven you to do some great things going forward. I began my quest to learn about Black history after being insulted by a teacher. We were covering American history at the time, and I raised my hand. I was in junior high school. I think I might have been maybe in the eighth grade. And I raised my hand, and I asked the teacher, I said, were there any Negroes involved in the American Revolution? And his, his answer was very stern and very quick and sharp and he said to me none negroes played no role whatsoever in the american revolution other than being slaves i was insulted embarrassed and hurt because at the time uh, i was the only black student in the class and i asked the question to be a little proud of my own background but instead i felt melancholy knocked down kicked around abused and hurt. So after that, I said to myself, I know there's something that we did, and we will be presenting some information to you today that may be an eye opener as to why we need to look differently on the history of Black people today. Thank you, Zach. Yes, yes, most definitely, and well stated, sir. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, yeah, you know, I think we all know how that can feel, and. Uh, so many folks do feel uh, that way and have felt that way. But uh, there's also a wonderful 
richness uh, to our history and to our story um, that uh, someone like a Carter G. Woodson, for example, has uh, helped us uh, to understand. Um, can you uh, tell, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, who Carter G. Woodson was and why is he significant? Dr. Carter G. Woodson has an interesting past. He was the second black person to graduate from Harvard University. And what he did, he looked at how we were ignorant of our own history. Actually, how the world was ignorant of the history, quote, at that time, the Negro. He wrote a book in um, 1816, um, I'm sorry, 1916, and the book was called The Miseducation of the Negro. And in the book, he pointed out how the history of Negroes had, in fact, been purposely, purposely hidden from the public. So he set apart, he set about writing interesting uh, 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 factual information about the Negro at the time. And he got, he received much popularity for his writing, and he elected to then say, why don't we have a time set aside during the course of the year where we celebrate the history of Negro? And uh, he began what we now call, well, actually at the time it was called Negro History Week. Mm -hmm. And it took a long while for it to really get, you know, get some steam. It was later, oh, close to maybe the 1920s, 1930s, during the time of the Harlem Renaissance. Oh, gosh, that's a time period you might want to research on your own. Harlem Renaissance. It was just before, it started just before the outbreak of World War II and not long after World War I. And during that time, there was a lot of interest in our history. And it caught on with local newspapers and magazines, and it went from being Negro History Week to Negro History Month in the 1960s. Now, a lot of people ask, why the month of February? The month of February was chosen by Dr. Carr G. Woodson for two good reasons. His heroes, his first hero was Frederick Douglass, and Frederick Douglass was an outstanding orator. He was the Dr. King of the time. And his other hero was Abraham Lincoln, both of whom were born in the month of February. That's why he chose February as the month to celebrate our history. That's absolutely right. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, Frederick Douglass, for example, uh, not unlike so many uh, enslaved folks did not know his actual birth date. And he, <laughs> in his case, in a pre previously, Right, in his life, way before Carter G. Woodson, right, uh, uh, chose Valentine's Day um, as his uh, as his birthday, and so you're absolutely right. This is why we celebrate in in February. Uh, it's excellent. Now, you, when we were talking and planning, uh, you you wanted to talk about a little bit about going that whole question of you know going beyond. Uh, the stuff we often hear about sometimes during Black History Month, um, you know, some people kind of feel like, well, we tend to dwell on too many of the same areas. You know, you hear about, certainly about Martin Luther King, and you certainly hear about Rosa Parks, and slavery may be mentioned. Um, and when it is, it's mentioned in a way that really limits sometimes how uh, we just as people, right, the theme this year, Black History Month, is the Black family. Just how we as family, as, as a Black family, if you will, see African-American history. What are some of the, what are we missing? What are some of the things that we need to know about to really get a, a more, a longer and wider understanding for our young people so that they can, you know, help somebody else and teach them about some of our heroes? Who is this, for example, Pedro Alonso Nino? Well, actually, Dr. Molesky, you opened up a Pandora's box. And let me tell you why. You know, when we talk about the history of the Black man, we cannot just assume that our history began when we were, when, when we were brought here to these shores as slaves. We cannot begin that as our only uh, the designation of history. Not at all. Remember this. You know, mankind has been around at least 10,000 years. 
at least 10,000 years. And all of the anthropologists, that are, those are the people who study ancient mankind, all agree that mankind began in Africa and that the movement of people moved from Africa into other parts of the world. That's a start point. So this part of slavery, which existed for roughly 430 years or so, all right, was only a small slice of our grand and wonderful history. And I encourage you on your own to Google black nobility in Europe, and you will be astounded to see the achievements made by blacks in European circles of nobility. But getting back to the question, Pedro Alonso Nino, and actually he's a replica, he, he replicates much of what I'm going to, to, to share with you now. Yeah. You'll see where, you know, he's a Spanish explorer. He sailed with Columbus. Whoopi, all right, great, wonderful. All right, Pedro Alonso uh, Nino was known as El Negro, meaning the black. He and his brothers were sailors with experience in Atlantic journeys. But what I want to bring your attention to is that uh, sentence that says that Pedro was a pilot of Santa Maria ship. There were three ships, the Nina, the Pina, and the Santa Maria. The Santa Maria, obviously, was, in fact, the, the uh, Kino um, ship. He piloted the ship. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to pilot? And now he was in the perch. That is that, that, that little cage where you look out and he says, land ahoy! It was Pedro Alonso. But there's something even more important that history fails to tell us. And that is this. The Nino brothers, and I believe we have a slide that will point this out. The Nino brothers owned, owned the ship that Columbus sailed. Hey. The Nino brothers were known as uh, explorers. The, uh, Pedro Alonso Nino received a commission from the king of Spain, mm -hmm. Ferdinand, and his wife Isabella to be the governor of the Atlantic. He was no slave, ladies and gentlemen. He wasn't a slave at all. He was a free man of means who lived in Spain and owned ships, him and his family. And they leased the ships, the Santa Maria, the Nina, and the Pina, to Columbus. And at that time, there was a lot of fear about the sailing, you know, going, going west. Oh, my gosh. You know, the world was flat. You're going to fall off. Hmm. It was Pedro Alonso Nino and his brothers who convinced the rest of the staff to venture out, knowing that what was told to them that the world was flat was not true. So Pedro Alonso Nino has a special place in the history of the founding, if you will, or discovery, if you will, of America. I did not know that he was the same Nino as the Nino. I've heard about these Nino brothers, and that is amazing. That's it. So, so that is to say that they were of African extraction, <laughs> as they would have said. Well, uh, El you know, right in his name. You know, as I said, you know, second paragraph, Pedro Lazanino was known as El Negro. What does that say? No mistake. You mean the blood. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that, 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 oh, uh, you go ahead. One other point, too. One other point, too. And uh, it's not part, I didn't want to get too deep into, if you go back to that slide with Pedro, please. I didn't want to get too deep into this. But what's, what's amazing here is that. Imagine now, if you were to look at it geographically, here is Columbus in Spain, and they sail all the way down to the Gulf, Gold Coast of Africa, and then they go west. Why did they do that? Why did they just sail right from the port there in, uh, in, uh, in Spain and just sailed west? Why did they do that? Because it was known that the currents were flows from the Gold Coast of Africa. And every storm that hits America follows that same trail. To this day. Because of, yeah. because of the wind current that yeah. brings storms here to America, the storms begin off the coast of Africa. 
Well, that's uh, that's both literally and metaphorically, because in this regard, a storm did did begin off the west coast of Africa. That the storm called the the slave trade and the Middle Passage, and and uh, I know that's part of it. And uh, hopefully, our students are um, able to follow. You know what what's what's being said here. It's it's a record of a erasure of you know some of the black folks you know, like 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 who we were just talking about and who this and this next gentleman who names you don't hear about as often unsung heroes who are there in the literature but uh, uh, without uh, a good guide just like a good librarian or a good teacher um, they're 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 harder to find now so so what about this gentleman this is more in my uh, neck of the woods, so to speak, uh, having grown up mainly in Boston and spent some time in New York and Long Island in the summers, uh, uh, in Andover, Massachusetts, Salem Poor uh, was uh, another name that I've come across. Uh, but that doesn't, that, that if you ask the common, you know, a lot of folks, and, and are they being taught this in schools uh, about a Salem Poor who, uh, and many other Black um, patriots who fought uh, on the side of um, liberty uh, for the revolution. And we should also note that there were some uh, black soldiers who also fought on the British side in other parts of the country, like Maryland, Lord Dunsmore, that kind of thing. But tell us about uh, Salem Port. Well, Salem, actually the picture we should have shown that really kicked off the, the American Revolution was uh, Christmas Adams. Yeah, maybe some of some of our viewers are familiar with that name because it but but then again, thank you for that's good that you mentioned that Fred because they can folks can maybe go look up Crispus Attucks just in case and find out who he was. Uh Crispus with you and Attucks with you. Yeah. Crispus Attucks was the first person who died in the cause for freedom here in America. As a matter of fact in Boston, you know, you, you, you probably know, you know read about the Boston Tea Party. And then, of course, you may have heard the shot heard around the world. Well, that first shot was the killing of Crispus Attuck during an, a mob uprising where they were protesting the presence of British soldiers in Boston. Now, the, our hero here is Salem Poor. And you'll read where, you know, it starts in the second paragraph. May 19, 1775, poor enlisted in a militia opposing the British troops occupying besieged Boston. Salem Poor is best remembered for his actions during the Battle of Bunker Hill. When other soldiers were retreating in fear, it was Salem Poor who urged them to fight. Now, why th is this important? Why is this guy you know, here to stand out in history? Actually, the battle really wasn't on Bunker Hill. It was really on Breed's Hill, but it doesn't really matter much. But what was happening is that here you had a group of farmers who were fed up with British control of their land, and they decided that they had had enough and they were going to fight the British. However, they were poorly equipped to fight them. I mean, it's just like you or I fighting Mike Tyson. <laughs> we just weren't prepared for it. We're not prepared for that. The same thing with these farmers. You know, and when they were uh, you know, uh, facing professional British soldiers, they, they were terrified, especially when some of them got shot and they were falling left and right, because during that time of battle, the way they fought battle was kind of crazy. They would stand up and look at one another, and sometimes they would be as, as close as maybe, oh, 100 feet or closer. Yeah. Matter of fact, it was, it was one famous um, general, who said, I mean, colonel, who said to his men, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Now, in order to see the white of someone's eye, you got to be pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. So they would stand up and look at one another and shoot. I mean, that was really kind of stupid, but that's the way they fought battles back then. Nonetheless, the Americans, you know, turned around and they started running. And it was Salem Poor said, no, we fight as men. And he encouraged them to fight, even though they lost the battle. Their losses would have been far more if they had continued to run because the British would have tracked them down and killed them one at a time. But when they turned and started shooting, then the British stopped chasing them. Yeah. That's why Salem Poor yeah. was a hero for the day. You know, 
Christmas addicts first to fall in the American Revolution, as as, as <laughs> Mr. Nurse said. You have you have Prince uh, Hall. You have uh, a lot of other names that uh, 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 who distinguished themselves um, in bravery and battle in key moments. Uh, and here's another Salem Four. Yeah. The, as you can see at the bottom of the third paragraph, there were more than 100 African American and Native American soldiers fighting for the nation's liberty. There you go. And I want to underscore that by saying this. Imagine now, you have been a slave all your life, and you risk your life to fight for the freedom, and one with the hopes of one day being granted your freedom from slavery. Yes, sir. And this is what you risked, your life. There were 100 or more African-American and Native American soldiers who fought for the liberation of this country. And what did they fight for? They fought because they believed that one day they too would receive mention as being an American citizen in this new nation. And this war, you know, 1775, I think it, it culminated something like 18 and 19, I'm sorry, 1783. This was not an overnight fight. And you, as you read about the American Revolution, you'll see what it took for America to become America. Excellent point. Um, that uh, brings us, speaking of America, uh, one of our largest cities, our second largest city, Chicago, uh, but not sec you know, second in size, but certainly not in terms of importance. Um, and uh, many, a few, very few people know, however, that it was founded by uh, a black man. Um, tell us about uh, Jean Baptiste. Yes, yeah, Jean Baptiste Comte de Sable. And of course, anyone who speaks uh, Creole would say, my, my, you messed up the pronunciation of this name. Agreed, I'm sorry. Me too. <laughs> I tried my best. Um, he was a fur trapper, and he would uh, trade um, you know, different things and articles with the local indigenous people. We call them Indians, but really they were the indigenous inhabitants of America. And he would trade with them. And one of the, the chiefs that he would, uh, Indian chiefs that he, he would uh, trade with, his name was Ishago. And he, he, he established this, uh, this uh, trading post. And he named the trading post after this Indian chief, Ishago. And the name stuck. And that was the only settlement, the only building, the only anything that existed in Illinois, in that area that we now call Chicago, at the base of the lake. And from there, we continue to say, and use the name after that famous indigenous person, Ishago, we call now Chicago. Windy City. Yeah, who, 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 who would have known, right, a brother? When, and it gets real cold in Chicago. I was in Chicago uh, in February, oh, maybe about a good 20 some years ago. And it was minus 13 degrees. And the wind chill factor made it like minus 30 or 40. It was so bad. It was so cold that uh, I had a bottle of Coca-Cola in my pocket. And just as a joke, because I was with some other people, we spilled the Coke onto the ground. And before it hit the ground, it froze. <laughs> and all you could hear was ding, 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 as it hit the pavement. <laughs> it was cool. friends from Chicago will appreciate that story. Um, yeah, yeah. Here's another uh, uh, individual who uh, some may not know as much about uh, and certainly, but certainly would be, I think, known and appreciated in the Elmont area uh, of today, um, uh, Haitian. A man, uh, Toussaint Louverture, who, uh, again, I think I probably didn't say this right myself, but uh, who really leads uh, one of the first uh, 
major, major uprisings that ended up creating a nation, first black nation, first independent black nation in the Western hemisphere, today known as Haiti, once known as San Domingue and gone by other names. Uh, tell us about, about uh, yeah, yes. um, uh, Francois Dominique Toussaint de Overture, all right, liberator of Haiti. There were many slave revolts. Don't think that the slaves were, were docile people who laid down and permitted themselves to be abused and beaten and overworked. No, they were proud people also, just like you and I. And they didn't like how they were treated. And there were many slave revolts. There were many, many slave revolts. However, very few were successful. Most of the revolts resulted in the leaders being, being hanged, some of them being sold, and some of them being outright uh, killed right there in front of their fellow slaves. So the slave revolts was common. However, this was a very successful one in that a whole nation was formed by the people who revolted. Um, Matter of fact, it's, it's funny, as you read there, it says African born into slavery around 1743 on a sugarcane plantation led the world's only successful slave revolution. And that brings me to, to the word there. We all know hurry, hurricane. How did we get that word hurricane? What the slaves would say when they saw the clouds and the, and the wind swirled and build up, they would say, hurry, get the cane. And of course, that was the main crop in the West Indies. Hurry, get the cane in order to preserve it and keep it from being ruined by the storm. Hurry, get the cane. And simply became the word that we know today as hurricane. Wow, <laughs> so there's it, it, many interesting things here. Yeah, but it, um, uh, go on. Uh, well, I was just going to say for you, again, uh, our. our our book lovers, uh, C.L.R. James, James's book on the Haitian Revolution is called The Black Jacobins, J-A-C-O-B-I-N-S, uh, is a college level book, but, uh, but definitely, and even perhaps graduate level, but, but one that some people might be interested in. And, uh, uh, and, and there's some other, uh, to your point about other slave, enslaved uprisings, uh, Herbert Aftecker has a book on, there were, there were literally thousands, as, as, as Mr. Nurse said, uh, throughout, the, throughout America, British, you know, modern day British North America, but also in the Caribbean and so forth. So, uh, but he turned the light on. And uh, here's another interesting and important individual who helped us turn the light on to, and, uh, and, and also to communicate a little bit better. Tell us, uh, Louis Latimer. Uh, there were three black men who were known as the, the genius of the turn of the century. Louis Latimer, uh, James Beard, and, uh, and, and Granville T. Woods, who we'll see a little bit more in, in, in a moment. But Louis Latimer is an interesting person. Louis Latimer began his career as a draftsman. The draftsman is a person who draws you know, what uh, a thing is, is, it looks like, how you know, the, the lines, you know, how it was assembled, how it was made, and the details about different uh, items and products so that when the person who makes the discovery brings it for patent, that he can show the intricacies as to how the item is made so that others cannot threaten the patent and thereby sue and may claim that they were not the first to come up with this idea. Louis Larimer distinguished himself as an as an as, as a, uh, an extinguished. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah extinguished. Distinguished. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Distinguished himself. Thank you. I don't want to say extinguished. I don't want to say anything. Was distinguished himself. We're not. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> as being an excellent uh, draftsman, so much so that Al Alexander Bell hired him, and he's the one who did the draft work on the first telephone. My goodness. Now, while he was doing these kind of works, he became interested in what Edison was doing with the light bulb. And Edison had tried thousands of experiments. And he finally got this, this filament that would light up the light bulb. But the problem was 
the filament would burn out in a matter of, of hours. So, to, so the question was, how do we make this filament so that we can uh, light this light and keep it lit for a longer period of time? Mm -hmm. Lewis Latimer came up with a way called to carbonize or to add carbon to the, 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 the filament and put it into a glass bowl. So the bulb went off, <laughs> all right? And because of his ingenious um, invention, we now have the light bulb. And remember, it took uh, Thomas Edison almost 10 years with 5,000 different experiments to get to the point where he was. And Louis Latimer carried it the last couple of yards towards the touchdown line or to make the light bulb. Yeah, that's a good way. Black, oh. black genius, black genius, yeah. and black brilliance. You know, you you really can't go from your home to work or to any any other place without encountering at least two or three uh, American patents filed by black American men and women who were inventors who were uh, also had that touch of genius and that flash of brilliance that helped us in this case literally you know, to do something that we take for granted every day. What a powerful example. Hey, hey Dr. Zeb, here's yes. something that just came to mind. It was in the year of 1882 that Edison received the contract to string lights and bring New York City out of darkness. The person he chose to lead the team, now remember, this is a time period where, you know, Blacks had recently come out of slavery, 1882. All right, blacks had recently gained their freedom. Many blacks were being disenfranchised, um, and, and, and unfortunately, lynchings were commonplace with blacks. It was commonplace. In fact, the word picnic comes out of that experience. And I'll leave uh, your librarian and others to better explain where that term comes from and what it means. But nonetheless, it was in this time period of 1882 where black men were not allowed to fraternize with white people, where black men were not allowed to work with white people. And here, Edison hires this man, Louis Latimer, to direct his entire staff to string the lights up, to light up New York City. And it is his, his invention and capability of running the lights that made it possible, along with the next person that we're going to be discussing, that made it possible for the A train to run to Rockaway. Because Louis Latimer also was able to discover a way to dig tunnels for uh, subway systems or rail cars, as it was called inexpensively and quickly. One of the geniuses of the turn of the century, which yeah. brings us to Granville T. Woods, the other genius. Yeah, what, what, why did they call him the Black Edison? Uh, because, uh, <laughs> well, he had, <laughs> well, he had I, six. I, mean, I can say something for a minute and then we can edit that for him. But, but yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. I think he wrote the you, topics. As you can see, he had 60 patents. As a matter of fact, Edison sued him over several of the patents. Yeah, and we're talking, but, we're talking about Granville, Granville T. Woods, uh, born yeah. three African-Americans, held various engineering and industrial jobs. The other, another name that people may have heard but may not know that much about, uh, he, has, he was a businessman, he was a, these are multi-billion dollar patents and inventions when you include interest over time in terms of what they've been used for in big industry and just by everybody really we're talking about the light we're talking about uh but this man had registered nearly 60 patents in his lifetime uh and uh, tell us about some of those okay um well there were really two grand inventions that he had uh, uh discovered one was you ever notice if ever you ride the subways you'll see two tracks. Then on the side, you'll see another track that's covered. And that track is known as a third rail. And how the train would run, the train, well, actually, yeah, yeah you, it's hard to see it with this, in this picture, 
Um, but uh, there's a actually electrified, so that's not the uh, yeah. These yeah, yeah. Colleagues, but we have another one that I'll, I'll, the one you sent me. We'll, we'll get that in there. Well, we, we, we can show that one after. But but uh, it, there's a third rail, and that rail brings conductivity or electricity or electrify the train so that it can run without needing a diesel, you know, locomotive to pull the train. So that was one of his inventions. But perhaps his greatest invention was this. Imagine a telegraph system with was overhead wires. And of course, you remember the old you know, pictures of seeing that uh, telegraph uh, board where you go tick, 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 tick. Well, he was able to find a way to draw that tick, 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 tick sound and communication that went through these telephone wires to an actual board that was on board of the train now imagine now the train is, is is moving down the track and they're able to pick up the signals from the wires and thereby communicate so that trains would not run into one another and, pre and this way it would prevent accidents but as you can see there he is normal you know and <laughs> gravel t woods with some of his inventions and you can see one the top right being a um uh, a locomotive uh, a, a component for a steam engine. You can see it there on the top right is a steam engine. And then into the, and this is the draftman kind of work. This is where the draftman comes in to play here. Much like when we talk about Lewis Latimer having to draft his, 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 his inventions so that someone else can come along and say, well, you know, I have something very much like it and I was the first one and I challenge the patent right. And once you have the patent right, you have the exclusive um, uh, uh, ownership of the item that you patent. So, he, you know, you know Graham T. Woods worked for Graham B uh, Bell also in some of the parts and intricacies for the telephone. In the next slide, I think we'll show the, the wires a little better for uh, something similar, another invention, I should say that uh, Grandma T. Wood is credited for. No, no, the one above that one. Go to the one above this one, please. Oh, the, of the trolley car? Yes. Okay, give me uh, give me one second. Give me, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna just edit this part out for a second. Give me one second. Come back to this. coming back so go ahead you can just pick it up uh whatever you wanted to say about the third rail or the trolley picture so, yeah. okay there you go now look at this trolley and the trolley you'll see overhead electric wires well those overhead electric wires and you'll see from the top of the bus there is a long pole that seems to be touching those wires well those wires were electrified and the bus would receive power from the contact it was making with those wires, thereby being <laughs> talking about green technology. <laughs> they weren't using diesel, all electric. So the trolleys were all electrical. Yeah. And they were operated by, by this long pole that would make contact with the overhead electrical wires. And that's what ran the bus. That part of the invention was made by Granville P. Wood. And those buses ran in New York City all the way up to the early 1950s. When I was a kid, I used to ride on a trolley on Sterling mm -hmm. Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Amazing. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember the trolley too in Boston, at least. Different. different they, they, they phased them yeah, out much later. Um, yeah. But the and, and, and I know that they, they moved to what they call trackless trolleys, which are really buses that are powered the same way. Um, they don't need the track, but that invention is a cleaner, greener uh, uh, way of doing it. And uh, 
wow, what a what a contribution. And the rides, no one can forget going on the trolley somewhere. Uh, if you grew up at uh, a place that had a, a trolley like this, and of course in San Francisco, they got uh, a couple other uh, things with trolleys. Yeah, um, these are the kind of important transportation innovations and, and things that make life, modern life possible, uh, aren't they? And so how about, okay, so moving on, what about uh, Norbert? I'm not gonna even try to say this one, really, really. Relics, relics. Relics, see? Yeah. <laughs> Norbert Relics, who was he? Okay. As we see here, um, you know, it, the man died 1894. So in other words, he was an early inventor also. During the same time where you know, many blacks did not know freedom. Many, he was born during a time when blacks were enslaved. And yet, in spite of the slavery, in spite of all of the hardships, they were able to pull themselves up and command authority and command you know, a portion of science and, and, and intelligence that made them stand out above all men. Noble Relics, uh, American French, uh, um, he pioneered the way sugar is made. Imagine this. Uh, many of you may have seen sugar cane. And sugar cane is just that. It, 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 it's a hard, like, bamboo stick where the fibers are, um, you know, are shooting. You know, uh, you know, fiber inside of a bamboo is sugar. And it's very, the fibers are very sweet. But the problem was, how do you make sugar from this bamboo uh, with this with all these fibers in it? Very starchy. And, yeah. yeah. And as you can see, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's right side up. But um, his, his evaporator, he used an evaporator machine where you would take the raw sugar cane. And, it, and as you know, the bamboo is very hard. Bamboo is... Uh, you know, um, uh, rot is very hard. Mm -hmm. it is, it is, it was almost like the skin of a, of a coconut. Yes. And yes. he found a way in which he could process this hard bamboo into, you know, uh, and, you know and, and extract the sugar from it in a way that was practical. Because one of the things that, um, that the Europeans found very acceptable was the advent of sugar because the Europeans had not seen sugar prior to the, you know, the, the conquistadores coming into the Americas in South America. And they brought home um, sugar cane. They brought home tobacco. They brought home, you know, other products that were exclusively available in America. That's right. And all of Europe, you know, clamored over sugar because they had something to make sweet their tea. <laughs> uh, one of my it, professors, Ernie Allen, used to say Europe had a sweet tooth. <laughs> yeah, they had a sweet tooth, all right. <laughs> yeah. So, so they, they, you know, they had a, a strong craving for sugar, and sugar was very expensive. So this 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 invention allowed for sugar to be made inexpensively, and it made possible the candy industry. Without this invention. The candies that were made in the turn of the century would not have been made possible, which include Hershey's, which includes Mars, and which include M&M candies and other um, uh, 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 sweet candies as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, why don't we know the name Alice H. Parker better? <laughs> you know, we included, you know, you know uh, something of importance that was created by women. I don't want anyone to think that, you know, all of the great discoveries and creations were just made by men only. No, women played a very important role in many of the, de the devices and, and uh, uh, things used. You know, it's, I mean, whether it be uh, the comb that we use to comb our hair, whether it be the hot comb that we use to straighten our hair, whether it be the broom and the dustpan, you know, whether it be the mop, etc. You know, women played a very important role 
in the creation of many things that we enjoy today. But Alice Parker, she stands aside because she designed something that women don't normally poke, I mean, put their fingers to, um, particularly you know, with this invention. Before this, all homes were basically heated by the fireplace or with cold stove in the living room. And she used natural gas because natural gas was being used at this time, you know, in the, in the early 1900s oh. to light lamps. We use gas lit lamps um, to light, um, you know, our homes. I mean, you, you would have, have lamps on the side of the wall or hanging from the ceilings, the chandeliers, and they were fueled by gas. So there was, um, you know, uh, an active use of gas in in residential homes you know in the turn of the century and she looked at that as a possibility to create a furnace that would bring heat to the home as well particularly multi-level houses imagine you know living in a house let's say you know a 10 family house or, or larger and everyone was reliant on the coal furnace and if you had a strike with the coal you know, delivery people or the coal producers, then you were coal. Mm. Yeah, not to play on words, right? You're cold because you weren't able to get coal to heat your furnace. So gas was abundant. Gas was cheap. Gas was clean. And it was only a natural that we, that, that we would use gas to fuel our homes for our stoves as well as to heat our homes. So it was Alice Walker, Alice Parker, rather, sorry, who created and designed a natural gas fuel improved heating furnace. And of course, you had to control this furnace. You had to know when you wanted to, to burn and when you wanted to, to be turned off. Right. So her invention of the thermostat, I mean, imagine we take these things for granted having a thermostat. Yeah. yeah. When you're cold in your house, the first thing you want to do is turn up the thermostat. Well, how do, you, how do we get a thermostat? So now you were looking at the person who was involved in making both the, the, the uh, gas fuel here available to us, as well as the thermostat. Wonderful, wonderful. And then we're all, it's all on our minds in this, in this wintry time of year. Um, um, that's, a, that's something that I think people will be able to look up and take with them. What a contribution. And I guess, you know, the lingering question behind all this is why don't we learn these names in school? Why do we only learn uh, some of the same kinds of things. And so we hope, uh, young folks, that you'll take some of this information, share it with your friends, uh, understanding that this kind of approach is very reminiscent of what you will take and you'll be able to take some high schools, uh, some special teachers around in and around the districts who do teach this stuff. And I hope, I, I hope you'll seek them out if you're interested. Um, um, and it will prepare you for what you what you will do in college as well, and it will help to make you more competitive in applying for college and universities. Uh, to reach for the stars, uh, like our uh, our last example uh, did, blazing a trail that all people were proud of, all black people, all, and, and, but especially black, an example of ingenuity, science, STEM uh, for black women, doctor. Mae Jemison, uh, tell us a little bit about her and why you, uh, for, uh, Mr. Nurse, wanted uh, us, your, your students uh, uh, of all ages and of all uh, education backgrounds to know about this. <laughs> well, actually there are two reasons. I remember sitting in a classroom at Alva T. Stanford Junior High School when uh, astronaut John Glenn went up and circled the earth and came down. And it was such a marvelous time. Everybody was glued to the TV on the launch and late the next day watching the splashdown. Mm. And I asked myself, I said, you know, it'd really be nice if one day our people would be included in the NASA program to be one of the first to go to the moon and to go and see the stars outside of our atmosphere. And it took a long time for that to happen. 
1992, she was selected as being one of the astronauts uh, who was called by NASA to take a space shuttle, <laughs> the space shuttle Endeavor, and orbit the Earth. And it was really beautiful because it was a time when you know, America needed to be proud of the NASA project. It was time to take pride in our involvement in NASA. There's a movie, and I hope it will be shown. Uh, it's called, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, um, the, 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 the Hidden Colors. All right. Um, and I hope that Hidden you figures. would see that. Yeah. Hidden figures. Hidden figures. I'm sorry. I hope that you might one day see that movie because it showed the involvement of so many wonderful black women who made NASA possible, who made John Glenn's flight possible. And these were women who had received no attention, no recognition. And unfortunately, after the project, many of them were even fired and let go because they had done their job so wonderfully yeah. that now yeah. others were taught their work and they all of a sudden found themselves no longer needed. Yeah. But you know, it, it underscores our history, the history of us having to overcome the adversity, having to overcome everything that was foul and ugly to be thrown at us, to be told to us, and yet we found a way to stand tall, to stand proudly and claim our place in history. And we end with Dr. Mae Jameson, the lady who took us to the stars. A wonderful person. Look at her, her, her gorgeous smile. Yes. But, it, but you know, that same time that Dr. That uh, John Glenn went up in this, into the skies and orbited, orbited the Earth this one time, she orbited the Earth for a week. But John Glenn just orbited one time and came down. And I had a teacher in eighth grade. And she taught me something. Her name was Mrs. Brand. None of you would ever know her. You might be able to look her up one day. But she taught me something that I'll never forget. She told me that knowledge is power. And we teach this material to you so that you, too, can become knowledgeable of your glorious history. And believe me, this is just one little uh, tiny bit of our illustrious history. Having the knowledge, you will be empowered to do great things, knowing that you are a great person, part of a great race, and part of a great universe of people. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's beautifully stated, sir. And I, I want to thank you for your time today. I also... I did want to uh, pick up on your point to share uh, with uh, our audience that uh, Dr. Jemison, May Jemison, actually has a book out uh, since we're talking a lot about books, uh, which is a children's book, a young adult's book, actually. Uh, Find Where the Wind Goes, um, Moments from My Life, Dr. May Jemison. And uh, it was a recent program put together by PBS Books uh, we love PBS books. They do uh, really good work. And you can uh, find out more information. Uh, we, we, we're coming full circle where we started from. Uh, we, we talked about Carter G. Woodson, the organization that he started uh, to, to continue the tradition of Black History Month uh, is uh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And the association is working with PBS books uh, already, uh, it already aired a few weeks back, but uh, you can find that at um, www.youtube.com slash A-S-A-L-H TV to find out more about what uh, Mr. Nurse was talking about. And so, sir, we want to thank you. Uh, I am over here just uh, hey. uh, <laughs> leading an applause, a virtual applause that I'm sure will echo throughout uh, the month and through the year because these this video will be made available uh, to the viewing public to watch uh, at their leisure and we ask that you share the video and I also uh, wanted to uh, remind our our listeners and watch the viewers um, 
that uh, we, you know, of our information, our contact information. Uh, should you have any questions uh, or, or want to, you know, reach uh, either Mr. Nurse, Mr. Fred Nurse, or myself, um, uh, you can do so at the following uh, email addresses. And so, um, uh, in the tradition of African American history and Black studies and Africana studies, uh, we thank you and we greet you again uh, as we say goodbye uh, to remember some of these approaches and what informs the very exciting profession and enterprise. We have a tradition of teaching and learning through talking to one another. And I think that this has been one of those occasions. So I salute you, sir, I thank you. And I hope that uh, people will find and know uh, the teacher, the local griot, really a keeper of many stories and much wisdom, uh, Mr. Fred and Nurse. So we thank you, we thank you, sir. And- uh, Quite welcome, glad to have uh, participated. Okay. And I wish, and I wish the, the, the library much good fortune in reaching the young men and women who need to receive the education that we share today. Thank you. Have a great Black History Month. Thank you.